just build it bigger. As an architect, I have traveled the world investigating some of the most incredible feats of engineering. And right now, I'm going to take you behind the scenes of the most dangerous construction project in the world. Over two and a half miles below the Earth's surface, the deepest gold mine ever is getting deeper by the day. In three, two, one. At over 12,000 feet under the Earth, where earthquakes are a constant threat, 5,700 of the world's toughest workers face the job site with temperatures hotter than 150 degrees. My God, burning hot water. Where makeshift supports hold back millions of tons of rock. I'm gonna lose it. All for one of the most valuable metals on the planet. Solid gold. That's not even a joke, that's, that's actually solid gold. I'm in Johannesburg, South Africa. The locals call this place Ekwili, which means city of gold. And quite literally, the soil under where I'm standing is the richest in the world. Located in the northeastern highlands of South Africa, Johannesburg sits above half the world's gold deposit. When gold was discovered in Johannesburg in the late 1800s, people flocked from all over the world to mine this ore. It was so plentiful that you could actually see the gold on the surface. Over time, mines opened from the east side to the west side of the city, mining deeper and deeper into the earth. Today, there are 70 gold mines in South Africa, employing over half a million people. The problem is, after over a century of mining, this precious resource is beginning to run out. In the last 10 years, the country's gold production has dropped 45%, while the price of gold has skyrocketed. Now, to re-establish the nation's most important industries, one South African mine is attempting to dig deeper than ever before. An hour outside of Johannesburg, the Mpenang mine is already the deepest mine on the planet, a subterranean gold factory two and a half miles down, with more tunnels than the New York City subway and the world's longest elevators. However, most of the original gold deposit has already been mined, and the rest will be gone in just eight years. So to keep the mine going, geologists have been drilling and testing in all directions, searching for more gold. They finally found it, a new deposit called a reef, located over three miles from the surface, holding over 140 tons of gold, worth over $6 billion. So if you didn't go deeper, within about seven or eight years, you would have simply mined all the gold that you can get at that depth. That's right. So this new project gives you the potential opportunity to extend the life of the mine by how many years? Well, the, the, the life of mine with the current project, um, the life of mine will be extended to 2029. 2029? That's correct. So instead of seven or eight years, we're talking about 20 years. That's right, yes. While the team mines out the final gold deposits in the existing mine, they've also added a new deepening team. Their job, tunnel 7,000 feet deeper to reach the new reef, one blast at a time. The commute to a job a third of the way into the Earth's crust takes an hour and a half. The trip starts in the longest elevator in the world, a 50-ton beast that carries 120 miners at a time. You know, given where we're going, Gordon, you guys didn't do much to kind of soften the blow and make this thing look nice. That, that, this is it. This is mining. This is reality. You ready? OK. All right, let's go. Why don't keep All right. Here we go. The elevator travels at 40 miles an hour. It pretty much feels like you're free falling down into the earth. Now 1,000 feet to the surface, 2,000 feet. I'm now deeper than the Grand Canyon. I'm now almost at 8,000 feet. For every 100 feet we drop, the rock gets one degree hotter. Every couple hundred feet, it gets a little bit hotter, a little bit more pressure, and you can feel that inside your head. 
We're now approaching the bottom. This will be 12,600 feet. Keep in mind, this is the deepest point that any mine has ever worked at in the history of mining. From the bottom of the elevator, it's another mile and a half to the face of the tunneling project. Morning. Morning. It's morning, by the way. <laughs> it's the blackest black that you have ever seen in your life, is underground. Because there's no other light source at all. I mean, we are so far from the sun right now. 12,000 feet further than we were this morning. The closer you get to the active face of where the rock is, the hotter it gets. So as I step down, right, every single step, I can feel the temperature getting slightly higher and slightly higher. And right there, that is the very deepest point in this mine. It'll take 600 blasts to reach the new gold reef. They're prepping for blast number 540. And blasting in the deepest spot on Earth is unlike any other kind of blasting. Faults scattered throughout the rock make earthquakes and rock falls a constant danger. Punishing geothermal heat also makes the working face a scalding 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my God. There's, that's burning hot water. The water that's being heated by this exposed quartzite is literally brought to the point of burning my hand just from the energy from the Earth. Energy from the Earth and then, of course, the drilling. Okay, so Gordon, this exposed wall right here, this is the wall that we need to get out of our way. Yes, there's gold back there. Yes, so this wall has to continue to push deeper into the Earth to enable us to go up and straight out to get that gold. Correct. The rock is riddled with faults which means the energy from the blast needs to be carefully controlled or risk creating an earthquake. They use a diamond-shaped blasting pattern that concentrates the first pulse of energy into the center, opening up a cavity for a second and third round of smaller charges to safely break up the edges of the face. Okay, now why do that? Why not just have an even amount everywhere? Well, you want the most energy in the center to, because this is the hardest place to break the rock in. As you move outside, you want less damage. If you damage the rock on the outside, you have to put more support in it. You want to keep the ground as stable and as fracture-free as possible on the outside. The dynamite is mixed and tested on site. But what are we doing right now? Right, we're going to test the explosives to see if it's mixed properly. There's two ways to do it, yeah. with a scale or the miner's way. Take the, put the thumb on your finger, Tongue out. Taste, battery taste, it's good. So if it feels like I'm licking a battery, I'm happy. That's it, just lick it, just, just put it out and lick it. Put it on your tongue. Oh, God. Got a good bite to it. Oh my God, that is, that is awful. Looks like it's good enough to use. Yeah, it's good, so blow up. Like loading a bayonet, we have now at the tip of my lance the explosive, the cable right here. Does he that off? This can't actually go off, can it? It's very slight. Very, very unlikely. Okay. Push it all the way in. Lance is now in. That's it. The crew pumps three gallons of explosives into each drill hole. Okay, so now the hole is filled with explosives. Loaded with explosives. And essentially, you, we're, we're embedding that bomb, that small piece of dynamite, deep inside of it. And then this becomes the way in which we tie all the different 64 holes together. That's it. And once that's done, we gun push the button. The crew retreats 1,000 feet up in the tunnel to detonate. All right, so let me just, let me just kind of put this in perspective. Where we're standing right now, we're about 1,000 feet away from a ton of explosives in a wall down there. We're gonna set it off and we are gonna be exposed to that explosion. It's gonna be happening right down there. In a cramped space like this, each one and a half ton blast can generate a massive shockwave. Gordon, you said something before about when the blast goes off beyond ear protection. Yes, keeping your mouth open protects your eardrums. It allows the equalization as the shockwave travels through. So I'm to open my mouth during the detonation so as the shockwave doesn't blow up my eardrums. That's it. This is really one of those moments in life where you, you gotta wonder, how did, it, how did I get here? How did I ever do this? Why am I doing this? What am I doing down here? 
I'm 12,000 feet under the Earth's surface. I'm in South Africa. I'm holding a detonator, and behind me are thousands and thousands of pounds of explosives, and I'm about to set them off. The charge is live. All right, here we go, guys. Open your mouths. Cover your ears. In three, two, one. That's it, we're alive, the blast is done, my eardrums are safe, look at these smiling, happy miners. We did it. That blast fractured 100 tons of rock. So Gordon, that, that's, that's exactly where the charges were set, right there, right? And it's right, right where those bolts are, that last line of bolts. That's where the face was before we blasted it. So Gordon, how much did we advance the tunnel with this blast? 10 and a half to 11 feet. Incredible rock that is 12 and a half thousand feet under the Earth's surface, rock that has never been seen by human eyes. It's been here for billions of years. And right now, today, Gordon and his team have just created the new deepest point on planet Earth. It's pretty good, man, I'm not gonna lie. It's pretty amazing. Coming up, I travel through two miles of tunnels looking for gold. Oh, dear God. When an earthquake hits. South Africa, the world's deepest mine is blasting 40 feet deeper each day, tunneling towards a reef of new gold worth $6 billion. Almost three miles down, each blast risks rockfalls and earthquakes. And with the latest blast detonated just moments ago, it is essential to quickly support the new tunnel face. Once the blast is complete, the now newly exposed rock is susceptible to the nearly 13,000 feet of pressure pushing down in the tunnel. So to make sure this is safe before any more mining can happen, these guys have to re-support the roof and keep this ceiling up above us. So once you remove the rock, all the pressure from the 12,000 plus feet of earth is pushing down in our heads right now. Yeah. So the tunnel wants to collapse. That's the natural desire of the earth right now. That's the natural desire. That's, that's what it tends to, to do, is to close up. So essentially, like Atlas, it's your job to sort of push back on this rock and support this open tunnel. Yes, that, that's my basically our job, what we're doing. You look like Atlas. You're a big man, you can hold back the rock. The temperature at the face is 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and ammonia fumes from the blast fill the air. Regardless, the team has got to begin work. They do it with a grid of 33 steel rods called split sets. The split sets work like giant screws, pulling the layers of rock together. They're driven four feet into the rock face, each holding back 17 tons of rock, half a million pounds in all. And so collaboratively, all of these 30 some odd split sets will give us this, basically the roof to know that it's safe for us to keep mining. Yeah, that's what's gonna happen. You got a big day, you got a big day. <laughs> the team installs them with a hydraulic drill and a motorized screwdriver. All right, so to get us started, Johan, why don't you drill the first hole? I'll drill the second hole. Go for it. So the first thing that's happening right now is that Johan flips the switch, and immediately water starts pouring out to cool down the rock. All right, so there it is. Now we have a drilled hole, 41 millimeters wide, hollow, and ready for steel. Now check this out, you're gonna watch some change bits. Out goes the drill, in goes the screwdriver. Yeah, look at that. All right, we screwed it. All right, can I give it a go? All right, Johan's stepping out, I'm stepping in. Each drill hole is just one millimeter smaller than the steel rod. Yeah! So when the rod is driven in, that one millimeter difference creates enough friction to hold back all 17 tons of rock. So above our heads right now, you've just applied over 560 tons of force to hold back the earth. Yes. I mean, that's what happens, I guess, when you have almost two and a half miles worth of earth pushing down in your head. Yeah. Incredible. That's what it takes to push this tunnel just 12 more feet towards becoming the very deepest occupiable point on planet Earth. When complete, 
this tunnel will be the central highway to 140 tons of gold. Once there, miners will use smaller tunnels called crosscuts to get it out. Miners were already using this method at level 120, just 600 feet above us. It's a two-mile train ride and then a mile-long hike to get to the exposed reef. And it's here we'll be blasting for gold. I have to say one of the most unnerving things about being on this project is you are so physically far from the shaft, the elevator, that if something goes wrong, you're very, very far from the escape hatch. The last 120 yards to the reef require a 22-degree climb. Essentially what I'm looking at feels like a mine from like 1880. We're looking at this amazing old wood ladder going all the way up this 20-degree incline. And that up there, there where you see the light is, that's where we're headed. That is where the gold is up there. Oh my God. It's just, it's just become clear to me that where I just came from, that ridiculous ladder, that was actually just the beginning. Look where we're headed next. Oh dear God. You've got to be kidding me. This is not what I was expecting. <laughs> is there any other way to get there other than this? No. Okay. Yeah. You get prepared emotionally and luminescently. Okay. Let's go. Carry on. The biggest danger when digging 12,000 feet down is triggering a seismic event. There are dozens a day down here and nowhere to go if one hits. To minimize the disturbance to the rock, the tunnels are kept as small as possible. Now, as I, as I walk up this precarious angle, just keep in mind, if I look to either side, it's these wood rock packs that are just literally holding this rock up, right? This rock, as you can see, has had its support taken out. They've removed the rock. So the inclination of this geology is to simply come right down on top of us. The support is needed to withstand the massive seismic shifts caused by the blasting. So Clive, on a given day like today, how many seismic events happen, for example? Um, we could have hundreds of seismic events, but most of them happen uh, during the blasting time. You mean when the blast just went off like four seconds ago? Uh, no, that's for the, not the development blast, but the phase blasting. Okay, so the blasting is going to happen here in the sea. At the phase, yeah. So we are on a sequential, uh, on a uh, centralized blasting uh, method. Everything's cool. That's all you like. Okay, what? My God, that was definitely it. I definitely thought that was it. I definitely was like, well, no, no, no. No, no, we're fine. Can I just continue? Oh, yeah, Claude, just continue with what you're saying. <laughs> Don't let the neighboring explosion in the rock uh, impede your, your progress. What's oh. happening inside of you, man? You're like, you're like a metronome. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest mistake you do, Danny, is if you start running, you're running into the danger. Yeah. If you stand still, if something happens, just stand still, because the moment you jump up, you can eat your head, fall over the rocks, and that's how you get out. By the time you've heard something, it's already too late. <laughs> I knew it was, I knew it'd say that. That tremor could have loosened the overhanging rock. And to make the area safe, we've got to resupport it. All right, so now what we're doing is we're going down to put in these supports which keep the rock faced up. And to be perfectly frank, we're going to do this as quickly as possible because there was just an earthquake that happened about, about four minutes ago. And, uh, and that means we just want to get out of here quickly. There are earthquakes every single day in this mine. They happen while blasting, and they're blasting right now. So we are essentially next to a very high-risk area. So it's this guy right here that, I mean, just like a column, is holding up the roof. And we can't do any drilling. No safe work can happen until we put in these support Let's columns. Say, well, I can't deal with it. I'm going to lose it. <laughs> That's why we put in support. <laughs> uh, I understand. <laughs> these four-foot-high steel jacks push against the overhead rock, supporting a whopping 10 tons apiece. To install the jack, they first clear the ground of any loose rock. 
So as you can see, what we're doing is essentially wedging this thing in, pushing it down solidly into the ground, and then pushing it tight up to the rock face. And this becomes a strut or a column that holds back this rock. So look at that, you can see right there, just like a jack that you jack up a car to change a tire, same principle. He's jacking it up, it's pressing up against the rock, and now this thing is one solid column, one of many that's keeping this roof safely above my head. Coming up, servicing the world's deepest elevator means slicing one of the longest and heaviest steel cables ever built. This is like an extraordinarily bad idea. For the miners that commute two and a half miles underground, three shifts a day, there's simply one way in and one way out. The elevator shaft. The elevators are the very lifeblood of this job site. They are what enable them to get 3,500 workers underground and at the same time pull above ground literally hundreds of thousands of pounds of rock. So given the extraordinary requirements on this site, these are no ordinary elevators. A typical elevator uses a weight to counterbalance the load. However, a weight for an elevator this heavy would be more than 60 tons. Instead, the mine offsets the cab with the second elevator. So when one elevator goes down, its weight pulls the other one up. Instead of having to actually pull the elevator up and actually lift its own load, you counterbalance its weight with another hoist. Yeah, with the, with the skip that is actually descending. That's a counterbalancing effect that we have in order to improve the efficiency of your winding cycle. With 300 lifts a day, the mine's elevators travel the distance to the moon every nine months. You have the weight of the rock, you have the weight of the hoist, you have the weight of the cable, and all of this is happening constantly on both sides, basically 24 hours a day. Yes, 24 hours a day, sometimes seven days a week. Including the 20 tons of its own weight, the total load on this rope can be more than 70 tons. Last year, a rope in a nearby mine snapped, dropping a cab, killing eight miners. So to prevent a similar failure, the team is performing a stress test on the elevator rope. What are we doing today? We're going to cut the front end of the rope. Um, and then to send it, send it away to the laboratory to, to be tested in order to ensure that the integrity of the rope is still um, um, all right. I mean, it's hard to overstate, but this is for the safety of people who are in the elevators, for the ability of you guys to mine. I mean, this, this is the lifeline of the project right here, right? That is right. It's a risky cut. Over time, thousands of trips up and down have twisted the rope, tightening it and building up enormous amounts of torsional energy. If I have a plastic shopping bag and I sort of spin that shopping bag, it'll spin and spin and spin and spin and spin, and all of that torsional energy is bound up in that, in that rope right there. And if I let go, it'll unspin very quickly. Yes. And today, as we cut this rope, all of that torsional energy is built up inside the rope. Yes. So we have to make sure to take out the spin before we cut the rope. Yes, that's correct. Yep. With the elevators offline, no rock will be hoisted to the surface. The team has only two hours to get the rope section cut and the elevator back in service. The first step is to secure the elevator with a crossbeam support. So it's this piece of steel right here that locks the conveyance in place so it doesn't fall when the cable comes out. Then, while standing on top of the elevator, they unhook the rope. And Chris, I have to put a harness on because uh, what happens when I fall down there? How far is that? Well, we, we will find you uh, 8,400 feet below. 8,400 feet down. In, in many pieces. In many pieces. Thanks, <laughs> Marnie, a man of details. The rope is held in place by a single 100-pound steel pin. It's so tightly wedged in, they have to use a hydraulic jack to get it out. That pin right there is the very last piece of steel that's holding this entire compensator to the elevator. So basically, we're gonna use the jack to just smack this pin out and disconnect the hoist from all the cable. All right, Marnie, let's do it. Come to me. Let's make it happen. Wanna bring the jack? You want, you want the hammer in there? Yeah. Okay. All right, Nick. Is this gonna go slow? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. 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 Whoa, Nick, Nick. Nick, man, you're going bananas over there. To be sure the pin doesn't damage the top of the cap, it's coaxed the final four inches by hand. 
So, Monty, the pin is like 99% of the way out, right? Yes. Okay, so slowly ease the pin out. Yeah, just, you just pull the pin out, yeah. All right. You ready? You want to smack? I'll smack. You hold. Yeah, I look, I look. I go, go, my go. Is it coming? It's coming. Ready? Ready? Okay. You got? You okay? But it's very good down there. Okay. I feel like we just kind of like delivered a baby here. <laughs> All right, so let's do it. The pin is now out. Let's separate the compensator from the hoist and get these cables over there so we can cut them. To keep the tightly wound rope from violently spinning out, first they have to clamp it down. You open this up, and then we're going to take the rope, lower it into this hole so that when we finally cut the rope, all that torsional energy, all that spin force will get released and controlled with this thing right here. The rope is locked in with four bolts. So this is essentially like a brake pad. Yeah. That's like a caliper on the brake. That's it. That's when it's it. cut, it wants to spin like crazy, but yeah. you can apply pressure. Pressure that won't spin. And slow that yeah. spin down. With the cable locked into place, the team can now remove a 25-foot section for testing. Because it's strong enough to lift three fully loaded semi-trailers, the only way to slice through it is with an acetylene torch. We're talking about, you're melting this thing. You're actually cutting it with a torch. Yeah. You have molten steel slag. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much embedded torsional force that when you cut it, when you finally cut the cord, it can actually spin out yeah. and spray you with that stuff. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, sir. Great. You can open it Do I need your glasses? I think this would be better. I think we better too. And also, let's be honest, yeah. I'm gonna look like a badass. I'll trade you those. They're, I have an astigmatism. I have an astigmatism. So, hey Nick, I'm gonna hit it right here, right, buddy? Yes. Right there. You like that? Yeah. You happy with that? Uh, Can you see with those glasses on? It's clear. Yes. You look pretty now. Yeah. Yeah, I look what? <laughs> pretty. I look pretty? You look yeah. handsome and clever. I don't know why, Nick. You look, always, you look so much smarter all of a sudden. <laughs> all right, I'm going to crack open the acetylene first. Open. Gets a little bit of acetylene going. And fire. This is like an extraordinarily bad idea. The torch burns at 3,000 degrees, which is one third the temperature of the sun's surface. There it is. She's opening up. It's gonna kill me. Oh, it's gonna kill me. It's gonna kill everyone. Extreme heat is needed to melt through the dozens of interwoven steel wires inside the rope. Oh, there it is. There it is. Oh! Oh! Ooh. All right, so I get back my glasses. Nick, the Boilermaker, gets back his torch. And we're set. Now that it's separated, we're going to release the tension and let all of that force out of the cable. Marnie, you ready? Release it out, start spinning, immediately pull yeah. it back, lock it up. Here we go. All right, everyone stand back. Let's release the tension. Dear God. Ready? That's it. Again. Finish now. Yeah. Well done. A little stressful, man. <laughs> OK. Okay, with the piece now cut off, this can go to testing. And now, as you can see over here, we have to re-spool this up, connect both wires, and ultimately, within about one hour's time, get this cable back in the shaft and the mine working again. Coming up, I strike gold. This is it. This is it. This is the gold. In some of the oldest rock on Earth. But first, what skyscraper has the world's longest elevator? The answer, after the break. Your trivia answer. Dubai's Burj Khalifa has the longest elevator at 2,000 feet, just a quarter of the size of Umpenang's elevator. South Africa has more gold deposits than anywhere on the planet. But the question is, how did the gold get here? Well, if you go back billions of years ago, this entire region was one enormous lake. Gold deposits were put into this lake from surrounding waters. Then, about 200 million years ago, a series of volcanic events buried this lake, thereby entombing the gold. And that reserve right there is the very stuff we're after today. Geologists know that the gold is two and a half miles down. The hard part is getting it out. 
After two miles of tunnels, it's a 100-yard climb up a 22-degree angle to find the mining face of the Gold Reef. Okay, this is it. This is it. This is the gold. This is the gold. This is the old body we're going to mine. This tiny, small, three-foot swath is why I'm now it's almost 13,000 feet under the ground. And with the same rod. And sort of packed inside of here in tiny amounts throughout. Uh, it's gold. The gold is in dark carbon particles scattered throughout the rock, making the reef grayish, not yellow in color. What's so incredible is the gold is so tiny that, I mean, I can't see it right here. Yeah, so little. I mean, specks of it, yeah. like, like particles of sand is inside of this. That's it. The fastest and safest way to loosen this ore is to drill and blast. Are we ready to rock and roll? Yeah, ready to drill. Where's the drilling? Right down here. Down here. So now we found the gold, now it is time to get it. Miners drill blast holes into the ore and fill them with a powerful emulsion dynamite. So we're gonna put a hole about four feet deep into this rock yeah, using this enormous drill. Yeah. Basically, this is just a very, very large chisel that's rapidly making contact with the rock. That's a, that's a big chisel. <laughs> that is a big chisel. That's a big chisel. Michael, Chuck, it is time for us to put a hole into this gold, get some explosives, and get what we came for. Yes. There we go. The gold reef naturally dips at a 22 degree angle, which forces the miners to perform precision drilling at a steep decline. Are you ready? Pull up. Yeah. Here we go. Push it. Push it. The drill runs on compressed air, hammering through the rock at six inches and 3,000 blows a minute. <laughs> my, my hand is still vibrating. You good. You good. You can be a thriller. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. The reef wall is now ready for blasting later tonight. The confined space and constant earthquakes mean blasting can only happen between shifts. Five tons of charges are detonated from the surface. After blasting, the rock has a five mile trip down into a storage silo, back to the shaft, and then up to the surface. After the blast takes place, all of this newly loosened ore will come sliding down this slope. It'll arrive here, in the gully. It's then when this device called the scraper will essentially scoop up this loose material and drag it all the way down to something called an ore pass. The scraper drops the gold hundreds of feet into the ore pass storage silo. And just to be very clear and straightforward about how deep this hole is, if I may. Yeah. It's like the colon of the earth. Twenty miles of trains and conveyor belts move the gold reef rock to the main shaft. It's there where the gold rock meets up with the waste rock from the deepening project. Both travel side by side up to the main shaft together. The contents of that conveyor belt are worth millions of dollars. The contents of that conveyor belt are totally worthless. And every single hour, this mine accumulates over 450 tons of both gold reef and waste rock. The challenge is to get them out of the mine and up to the surface. The reef and waste rock travel down a conveyor belt as long as a football field to two 50-ton elevators. The job of sorting the waste and the gold belongs to the conveyor operator. Hello, so hi, I'm Danny. Hi, I'm you. Nice to meet you. So in this way, this basically works like a dump truck, like the back of a garbage truck. Kind of open the payload, fill up the belt, close it up. 12,000 tons of rock pass through Nolizwa station every day. And this me. You got it. OK, you, you do the gold, yeah. I'll do the weight. You. Sort of appropriate, really. Here it comes for Big Dumper. Big Dumper. Not a lot of variation in the task. It's, um, 
open and closed. And closed. Open and closed. Sometimes we open, other times we close. Yes. She's got it under control. She is sending this stuff to a hoist, which is then going up to the surface over two and a half miles. Coming up, I enter one of the most highly secured buildings in the world to forge four million dollars of pure gold. Solid gold. That's not even a joke. That's, that's actually solid gold. Last year, South Africa's deepest mine produced 13 tons of gold and 2 million tons of ore. Every ounce of gold they mine produces three dump trucks of waste. Here at the Umpenang Mine, in just a 24-hour window, they pull out of the earth just 100 pounds of solid gold. Now, to get that 100 pounds of gold, in that same 24-hour window, they have to excavate nearly 15,000 pounds of rock. So to put this in perspective, in a given 30-day period of time, we're talking about nearly half a million pounds of solid rock building a veritable man-made mountain right next to the mine. Going from rock to gold takes 48 hours of processing. That happens at the mine's 20-acre on-site processing plant. So the ore that comes out of the ground is not a shiny gold nugget that I imagine a panhandler from the 1880s biting on. No. This is no. not it. It's no. not visible from with a, with a human eye. So we're talking about infinitesimally small bits of gold powder, yes. invisible to the naked eye, kind of scattered throughout this rock. And your job is to somehow get that microscopic powder out of the rock and then recombine it into solid gold. That's exactly what we do. First, a 4,000-ton mill crushes the ore into a sand-like dust. The team then mixes in cyanide and carbon to dissolve the quartzite and leach out the gold. The purified gold then goes to the smelting house for the final step of the process, melting and pouring. Today, they're pouring 10 55-pound gold bars worth $4 million the product of half a week of mining. So right now, in a matter of minutes, we're gonna pour out about 10 solid gold bars. That is correct. All of the mining, the digging, the blasting, the drilling leads to right there. That's the final product. The iron just come out of there. It is incredibly hot now that the gate is open. My face is actually burning. Four million dollars of, of liquid gold coming out of the smelter right now. Here it comes, here it comes. Wow, look at that. Each mold contains enough gold to buy three Lamborghinis. This looks like a science fiction movie. Look at that. That is incredible. Millions of dollars, Isaac. It takes only five minutes for the molten gold to solidify. You know when you finish baking a beautiful lasagna and you're about to take it out of the oven, but you're a little nervous you might spill it? Well, this is kind of like that, but a significantly more expensive version. Once we've got the gold into the mold, got to get the gold out. Flip the gold. Up. And over. Woo. Smack it out. And now, come on. There it is. Solid gold. That's actually solid gold. That's not even a joke. That's, that's actually solid gold. So, uh, Isaac, that scrap right there, we're gonna throw that away. We don't need that, right? I'll take that to the garbage for you. I'll just, I'll, I'll dispose of it. That is unfortunately not how we work. We operate here. So even that slag right there, you're still gonna remelt that and keep looking for more gold. Correct. So I can or cannot take that home with me? You cannot. No one's not. allowed to. No one's... Even the garbage has gold in it around here. The bars are encrusted with impurities, like zinc and silver. The gold is then transferred to a locked cage to clean off this waste known as slag. They're like golden brownies. This is like the burnt one that tastes good, you know, at the bottom of the, of the batch. Okay, so now that all 10 gold bars are stacked, we're gonna dump them into this hopper and begin the cleaning process. I'm Danny. Um, I'm Kivim Governor Koza. All right, so Governor, we're gonna now clean the gold. We're gonna wash the gold. Yeah. Even though the gold has hardened and cooled from its molten state, it's still 500 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Well, this gives you a sense of just how hot the gold is. We're putting in some lukewarm water. The gold is piping hot, kick it off steam. But now you can see the slag starting to come off and the shiny gold to begin to reveal itself. OK, now that the water is drained, the gold bars have been cooled off a bit. Now we're going to start pulling the slag off with this, the metal scaler. Now, removing these impurities is crucial. The bars have got to be 99% pure before they leave the plant. Governor, what do you think? It's nice, huh? Yeah, it's nice. You see here, it looks so beautiful, there. Right? Beautiful, clean, no slag. No slag. Ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. The finished product. Nice, shiny, solid gold. This 500 pounds of gold will be stored in a vault until picked up tomorrow by a high security helicopter. Coming through. Four million dollars of gold. OK. Well, there we have it. All 10 bars of gold, all four million dollars, have been delivered into the secure vault. But keep in mind, that relatively small amount of solid gold took over four days of solid mining, and all of that taking place over 12,000 feet under the Earth's surface. Two and a half miles below, at the deepest spot inhabited on Earth, the deepening team has nearly reached the end of their groundbreaking project. I mean, from your perspective, it's like every single day you are not just going to work, you're, you're literally breaking the world record every single day you guys push. Yes. It's gotta be yeah. kind of incredible. They have to give Guinness a call. Every day, though. Yeah. <laughs> the crew has 700 feet to go before they reach a $6 billion load that'll keep South Africa's most important mine producing gold for decades to come. The value of gold is a somewhat abstract concept. In principle, we know it's very expensive, whether it's a ring or a watch or a necklace. But until you see this project and physically experience just how difficult it is to extract this ore from the earth, can you appreciate just how precious a metal this is? And while this is an amazing feat of engineering, and this is the deepest mine in the world, the success of this project is not about breaking records. It's about the future of South Africa's most important